this video I'm going to improve on my cascade refrigeration system from last time and reach a minimum temperature of minus 112 C. In my last video I demonstrated how cascade refrigeration works and how it can be potentially used to reach cryogenic temperatures if it's implemented right. However, I wasn't very satisfied with the results of that video, so I've spent some time trying to make some improvements. The biggest issue seemed to be that the ethylene I was using as a second stage refrigerant was highly contaminated with hydrogen, which reduced the partial pressure of the ethylene, causing the mixture to require a much higher total pressure to condense. In an attempt to purify the ethylene, I tried to condense it and then collect the liquid, hoping that the hydrogen would just float away, but in the process I lost all of it because of the high pressure I was discharging it at and the lack of insulation. With a few changes though, this method actually would have worked, which I'll return to later in the video. I'm going to try that basic idea again, but this time with a much smaller container consisting of a 3 quarter inch diameter copper pipe in an insulated box which I'll fill with dry ice at minus 78 C. This temperature should require much less pressure to condense and hopefully make the process much easier. So I filled the box with dry ice and started pumping my ethylene hydrogen mix into the chilled pipe after allowing it some time to cool down. As you can see though, we've got over 500 psi and no liquid whatsoever when I vent the pipe. I'm not sure if there was even any ethylene at all in there. There's definitely something wrong with my ethylene production, so while I figure that out, I'm going to look for another second stage refrigerant. For commercial use, there's R508, which boils at minus 87C, but that's insanely expensive and I don't have a license to buy it, so that's out. A close relative of ethylene is ethane, which boils at minus 89C. That would be ideal, but from what I understand, it's relatively complicated to make, and I think attempting to do so is outside the scope of this project. In the same neighborhood is CO2. This is actually really easy to condense in a second stage. The problem is that at one atmosphere, it's below its triple point, so when it goes into the evaporator, it will turn into dry ice and clog up all the pipes. It does reach minus 78C at one atmosphere though, so if you could somehow solve the clogging problem, it would be a really good choice. That leaves just one gas, which is cheap and readily available, but kind of dangerous. Nitrous oxide. Nitrous boils at minus 88C. Its pressure temperature curve are perfect for a second stage refrigerant, but it's also a powerful oxidizer. I've got to make absolutely sure it never mixes with the propane in the first stage, and even if it doesn't, if the second stage compressor gets hot enough, it could combust with the polyester oil. Finally, even if neither of those things happen above a certain temperature, nitrous oxide will explosively decompose, much like monopropellants used on spacecraft like hydrazine or hydrogen peroxide. Fortunately, it's very unlikely that any of these things will happen because temperatures involved are so low and the amount of nitrous by mass is pretty tiny and there's no ignition sources in this machine. However, if you're going to load a refrigerant stage with nitrous, you should still make sure it's outside or in a garage away from people or flammable stuff. Also, as far as I understand, nitrous can actually be mixed with synthetic HFC refrigerants, just make sure you never mix it with hydrocarbons or anything else flammable. This leaves just one question, where do we get it? Well, I could go to a racing shop and get it in 20 plus pound tanks and spend hundreds of dollars for a new tank, but I don't need that much for a tiny refrigeration system. Fortunately, the food industry has us covered. A unique property of nitrous oxide is that it can dissolve in fat cells and it's non-toxic, so it's used as an aerosol for dispensing whipped cream. It can be bought online or in some grocery stores as packs of 8 gram cartridges, which are then used to pressurize a container full of cream. I bought one of these packs and a whipped cream dispenser, then 3D printed an adapter for a barb fitting so that I could flow the gas into one of my beach balls for collection. The adapter doesn't really need to withstand much pressure, so a 3D printed block with some glue to seal it worked just fine. When filled, the can actually carries a decent amount of pressure, as you can see here. I grab my trusty beach ball and start filling it one tiny canister at a time. After a couple minutes, I've got about 100 liters of nitrous and the can is freezing cold. Then I pump the nitrous into my condenser. At minus 40 C, it reads about 120 psi gauge, which is precisely what it should be. I was suspicious that my gauge may have been reading high in previous tests, but based on these measurements, it's exactly where it needs to be. I'm going to put a naked thermocouple directly in the path of the discharge from the condenser to see what temperature the nitrous reaches when it hits the atmosphere and expands. We initially hit minus 87 C and the reading bottoms out at minus 91 before coming back up. Considering that the boiling point is minus 88, this is exactly what we should be seeing. Here's a tiny amount of liquid nitrous oxide in a thermos. Now I know I mentioned that CO2 has a clogging problem because of icing, but I wanted to see whether or not that actually stops it from being a useful refrigerant, so I got a CO2 tank and filled a beach ball with some of the gas to pump into my condenser. 
I suppose I could have just connected the tank directly to the condenser too, but oh well. At minus 39C, we get 120 PSI again. Oddly enough, that's actually slightly lower than what I'd expect at this temperature, which should be about 140. Maybe the inside of the pipe is a few degrees colder than the attachment point of the thermocouple. Repeating the thermocouple experiment again, I discharge the now liquefied CO2 and get a minimum reading of minus 81C. The sublimation point of CO2 at one atmosphere is minus 78C, so this looks about right. I suspect that the couple degrees lower in this test and in the nitrous test are the result of a lower than atmospheric pressure zone right at the outlet where the high velocity of the gas causes a static pressure drop. Collecting it with a thermos, I actually managed to preserve some dry ice from the discharge. Of course, this could be done directly from a CO2 tank at room temperature, but that's not the point of what I'm trying to do here. With a capillary tube, lid, and steel wool baffle, I was actually able to collect a reasonably large amount of dry ice and filled my thermos about halfway. The only problem was that it was a fine powdery snow rather than a block of ice, so the large surface area caused it to sublimate away pretty fast. Another interesting observation I made was that before the CO2 was discharged, it caused freezing on the valve, which wouldn't happen previously with just cold gas inside the condenser. I'm pretty sure this is because the liquid phase has a much higher thermal conductivity, causing the valve to drop to a much lower temperature. Anyway, the CO2 did actually work when discharged through a capillary tube into an evaporator coil, but the flow was pretty erratic as ice would form, get blown out, then form again. This would cause the evaporator coil to spit little crumbs of dry ice periodically. I only got to minus 56C, but I've got zero insulation here, so I'm sure it would be much colder if it was in a foam enclosure. As for the clogging, I'm not sure if it would run continuously like this, or if a clog would just get progressively bigger until it wasn't possible for the pressure to push it out anymore. It's an interesting experiment, but I still don't think CO2 is usable as a second stage refrigerant, so it's back to nitrous oxide. I rigged up my beach ball and some silicon tubing attached to a capillary tube with some insulation as a second stage. For the compressor, I used this fancy new transfer pump I built out of a quarter horsepower fridge compressor. Everything is attached by soft lines because the low pressure side is at one atmosphere and I didn't feel like setting up hard copper lines after making multiple failed attempts at a second stage earlier. The capillary tube I used didn't quite have the right amount of flow resistance, so I control the nitrous flow by opening and closing the discharge valve of the condenser when the tank is closed to full. This is far from optimal, but again, this whole thing is just for demonstration. As you can see, when I open the valve, the temperature nosedives pretty quickly. This is being measured from a thermocouple mounted on the outside of the capillary tube outlet. We're not quite hitting that minus 88C because too much nitrous is being discharged when the valve opens, so a lot of the liquid is boiling farther downstream where I don't want it to. In fact, if you look at the clear tubing, you can see some liquid nitrous shooting through for a second before the line ices up. The same thing is happening at the collection beach ball, and even though it's several feet downstream of the evaporator, the barb fitting flash freezes when nitrous oxide is discharged. If all this cooling power was focused into the approximate location of the thermocouple, we'd see minus 88C, but for this demo I only got down to minus 76C. That's pretty cool, but I'm not quite thrilled with the idea of using a potentially explosive oxidizer as a refrigerant, so I revisited my ethylene generator to try and fix what I was doing wrong. First of all, there's way too much power going into boiling the ethanol. Several hundred watts are going into the ethanol, creating such a high flow rate that the catalyst pipe can't decompose all of it, so most of it just comes back over as liquid from the condenser output. This is a huge waste of energy, both on the part of the boiler and the extra gas required to maintain the catalyst at target temperature with so much flow through it. More importantly, there's a significant amount of hydrogen being produced, but from a source I wasn't previously aware of. See, when the unreacted ethanol leaves the aluminum catalyst pipe, it comes into contact with the copper line of the condenser. When exposed to copper at high temperature, ethanol catalytically decomposes to a compound called acetaldehyde and hydrogen. The acetaldehyde isn't that big of a deal, but the hydrogen comes over in the gas flow along with the ethylene and contaminates it. So for starters, I'll need a new ethanol boiler. I got this 250 ml flask which I'll stick a resistor inside of to act as a heater. When powered from an adjustable bench supply, this will give me a precise control over the amount of ethanol being boiled. Leads from the resistor pass through a stopper which has a hole for a barb fitting. I'll attach silicone tubing to the boiler instead of a hard copper line like I did last time. The silicone can handle the ADC boiling temperature of ethanol and is much easier to work with. Let's hook it up to power and give it a try. With 150 ml of Everclear and 80 watts of power, I'm up to a boil in just a few minutes. To give you an idea of how much ethanol is evaporated at 80 watts, let's ignite it. It's enough to produce a pretty impressive flame. 
I won't be using this much power when I connect it to the catalyst though, probably somewhere between 20 to 40 watts. Next I made this goofy looking clamp out of scrap wood. All this does is keeps the stopper from popping off when there's pressure, which was a problem before. I couldn't use 3D printed parts to do this because they would melt, and I was too lazy to set up my CNC to cut metal to do it. The flask goes into a box filled with ceramic wool for insulation, and looks like a weird little trash can when it's all put together. Next I got rid of my copper lines and condenser, and replaced them with aluminum ones to minimize the chance of producing acetaldehyde and hydrogen. There's a chance that a tiny amount might be produced by contact with the brass fittings, which are partially copper, but if it does happen, I think it'll be a negligible amount. After spending an afternoon making a new batch of ethylene, I hooked it up to my condenser and did the open flow temperature test again. Ethylene pressure reads about 180 psi at minus 45 C, which is a tiny bit higher than it should be, but still tolerable. Let's release it and see what happens. We bottom out at minus 112C. The boiling point of ethylene is minus 104, but again, I suspect this is from a sub-atmospheric static pressure in the high velocity region of the flow. Looks like I did it right this time around though. Let's do that same test with the closed loop, but this time using the new ethylene. This one bottoms out at minus 84C. This isn't too surprising since like before, a lot of the liquid is bypassing the area at the outlet of the capillary and evaporating farther downstream. Plus the insulation sucks. At this point, you're probably wondering, where do we go from here? Well, theoretically, I could build a three-stage device using ethylene in the second stage and methane in the third stage. But if the ethylene evaporator ran at minus 104C, that would require about 22 atmospheres of pressure for the methane to condense, which would then bring me down to a temperature of minus 162C if the methane evaporated at one atmosphere. That's a pretty high pressure ratio and a lot of extra complexity. It would also be pretty difficult to tune since I found that higher stages are much more sensitive to getting the capillary flow resistance just right and that sensitivity is compounded by more stages. It also doesn't get us to liquid nitrogen temperature. To do that there would have to be a fourth stage that was open circuit in which the high pressure nitrogen would condense at the evaporating temperature of the methane then get discharged into a collector. I think that four stages of refrigeration would be an engineering nightmare, and I don't think I'm ready to deal with that kind of hassle. Fortunately, there's a much simpler way to reach liquid nitrogen temperatures, which involves using a Joule-Thompson cycle on a single compressor, but with a mixture of hydrocarbons instead of pure nitrogen. This will be the topic for my next video, so be sure to subscribe if you don't want to miss that. Thanks for watching.